Well, good evening, everyone. This is our Wednesday night Bible study here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church here. And I want to welcome everyone as we gather, as we are continuing in the book of Philippians this evening, uh, as we are exploring just some wonderful uh, aspects of Paul's uh, just really wonderful relationship with the people at Philippi. And so as normally always, we let for people to log on. I'm in here in the narthex here in the building. A little bit different location than I normally am. Uh, uh, one reason why the sun's coming through the window, and I'm trying to avoid getting hit by the sun. So uh, uh, we'll get started in a few moments. Uh, as you come on uh, live, feel free to just add any information here if you'd like, or if you may be watching this later on recorded. I uh, just remember that uh, just to let us know you're here, uh, or you can remain anonymous. Uh, if you are watching this later on after it's been recorded, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to either text those to me, email, or anything like that. So we'll let people come on as we're starting to get begin in a little bit. see if the I'm being recorded by my cell phone and not my computer uh, I'll have to step away every so often just to see what our comments we may have in the comment bill and so uh, welcome welcome if you have any prayer concerns or requests feel free to post those online and we'll begin starting a few more moments we'll let a few more people log on before we get started If you have any issues with sound, like if you're not hearing me, let me know so I can kind of readjust on my end and uh, or if you're not seeing me. Like I said, I'm in a different location in North Texas than I normally am. Welcome, everybody. Give about another minute just to let people log on, those who are wanting to join uh, live, and then we will get started. Anything about the Facebook, you can join live or after it's been recorded or on YouTube or however. You have your Bibles, get your Bibles. We're going to be kind of continuing in uh, uh, where we left off last week. And, uh, All right, well, let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for an opportunity to gather online and in person. We thank you for our internet and all the Facebook connections that we have that allows us to engage and hear your word, O oh Lord. We celebrate your word that brings life and hope and challenge to us, O oh God. We want to thank you, Lord, this evening for the good news of Susan McIntosh, uh, real successful surgery. We want to continue to pray for Rocky as he uh, uh, continues to be in the hospital. Lord, we, we pray for tomorrow night as uh, I and some others gather uh, downtown in Louisville to just celebrate Scott Hareton's uh, victory over cancer and his uh, calling for us to be take his, to prostate cancer more serious, to focus on it, but we celebrate, Lord, what is the good news with him. And we pray for many in our country who are facing just all kinds of cancer struggles. Continue to remember those who are grieving the loss in this time of COVID, flus, and all those other things. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day and for all good things you provide. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to check one more time to see who's joined us, and then we will get started. All right. So, uh, we're uh, continuing to, we're coming to the end of chapter three, and I'm going to kind of transition to where we ended last Wednesday night, and to move into uh, uh, 
slowly begin to move into chapter 4. But I thought it might be good because we're going to come to a part in chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul will use the language, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it's from there that we're expecting the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about that because when, we, when that phrase citizenship in heaven is used many times and for me i would i thought this for many years that it automatically meant that my final home is heaven because after all if i am a citizen of something and i'm not there right now then that must mean that i'm going to return there and uh so what i want to do tonight is just look a little bit remember the context of the book of philippians okay it was it was written by paul paul who was in prison and he, wrote to, he, he had written to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi. And Philippi was a, a Roman colony. In other words, it was founded by the, the Roman government, the Roman emperor, where, where soldiers and Roman nationalists and all that would retire. Okay? Now, these were citizens of Rome. These were citizens of the Roman Empire. Okay? But they lived in Philippi. This was their home, okay? And, but their citizenship, their authority came from Rome, all right? And so just because you might be citizen of a certain place doesn't mean that that's where you're going to live because many of the Roman, retired Roman soldiers and such lived in Philippi. And the last thing that the emperor wanted was a whole bunch of retired soldiers in Rome because Rome was a pretty crowded place to begin with. And so... Uh, so basically, the way that uh, the, the letter of Philippians calls is like that there's this colony. And so, in some way, Paul is playing off this idea that we also are uh, citizens of heaven on earth. Okay? We're like a colony on earth. It's where we're living. But our authority, our mindset... How we, understand, how we understand things comes from the unseen realms of heaven, that we have a mindset. So on Sunday, we will say during our Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, where we are at, as it is in heaven. So whatever's going on in heaven, let that happen here on earth, in the same places. So with that in mind, I want to just uh, kind, of, kind of begin where we ended last night. If you remember last week, as Paul was ending this letter of Philippians, as he was coming to the end, he was beginning to uh, address warnings that he was concerned about people at the, in the city of, uh, excuse me, in Philippi. There were Jewish believers, or maybe something like that, who were basically saying that in order for you to be part of the kingdom of God, to be part of the Messianic community, you also had to do a lot of other things. And, Paul basically struggles that. He even uses the language, their end is their destruction. This is verse 19 of chapter 3. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory is in their shame, and their minds are set on earthly things. So then what Paul does is he says, their minds are set on earthly things. They have a mindset about earthly things. But then Paul gives the opposite of that. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Okay? So basically, he sets up. There are those who have a mindset. Their mindset is set on earthly things. Let me put it this way. Earthy things. And, the, and you know, earthy things are not bad things. It may not be the kind of good things. But Paul says, we are citizens of heaven. So our mindset is on heavenly things. All right? Even though we both live on earth. And so Paul says, our mindset are, are that we are citizens of heaven and because we're citizens of heaven, we have a heavenly understanding of life on earth. We have a, uh, a heavenly blueprint on how to live life on earth. And so then what Paul does, he says in verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it's from there, from heaven, that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, Paul says we, we are citizens of heaven, not because we are necessarily going to heaven, 
as our final destination. But instead, we are waiting, we're expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven back down to earth, where we are. And when he comes, as earth, when he comes, he says he will transform, verse 21, he will transform the body of our humiliation, that, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. All right, so he will come. So we who are on earth, who have a citizen mindset from heaven, we are waiting for the Savior to return from heaven. And when the Savior comes, he will transform our body of humiliation, of, of earthiness into a, a body of glory, okay? In other words, it's gonna be a body like Jesus. It will be the resurrected body like Jesus. And so, and then it says, by the power that enables him to make all things subject to him. So all things subject to himself. So in other words, the power that enabled Jesus' body to be resurrected, to be glorified, will be the same power that he uses to resurrect and glorify our body. But that same power will also, will also subject all things to himself. So this power will do two things. This power, Jesus' power. It will resurrect our bodies. Our bodies. And it will subject, it will subdue all things. So this power, so when Jesus returns, He's going to transform our bodies here on earth. And Jesus is then going to bring, a, a, he's going to bring all things underneath himself. Including those things that may hurt us, those things that may challenge us, those things that may trick us. And so then what we have is this beautiful picture, a, a future picture, which we see in other places, of a new creation to come, where Jesus is Lord of all. We a picture of Revelation 21 and 22 of a new heaven and new earth where we are resurrected and where Jesus is reigning over all things. And so I'm going to check to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Good. So we'll keep on moving on. All right. So our citizenship is in heaven. Not so much because that's our final only destination. Now do remember that we have, you know, about a year ago while I was doing a sermon series that Paul, well, I did a sermon series and this is something Paul alludes to. You remember in the book of Philippians, Paul earlier on talked about how he wanted to be with Jesus, okay? And you'll notice in the letter that when Paul writes to the church of Philippians, he says he wants to be with Jesus. And I'm going to let's go back and Look at that again, okay? All right, give me a moment. Uh, it says, and, and so this is chapter one, uh, beginning with for, uh, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and this, and, uh, and the help of the Spirit, Christ will help out my deliverance. He's in prison now. Is my eager expectation hope that I that I may not be put to shame in any way, that I may be speaking with all boldness. Christ will be exalted now, as always in my body, whether by life or death. Um, if I am to live in this flesh, that means truthful labor for me, and I do not wish I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. Verse 23, one, chapter one. For that is far better. But uh, I am part pressed between the two because I want my far better to be part and be with Christ. So Paul is saying, I want to be with Christ. I want to be with Jesus. And so Paul, when he's thinking about his death, he's not thinking about that he's wanting to go to heaven. He's thinking he wants to be with Jesus. And so basically, wherever Jesus is, that's where Paul wants to be. So as we've learned in Scripture, we know that then heaven serves as kind of the intermediate period. And so 
so that when we die, we who are followed Jesus, we will either be in heaven, paradise, or eternal sleep with Jesus, waiting for Jesus to return, to give us new resurrected bodies, to, to subdue all things under his feet, so that we can then now live a new creation to come. And so it's important to know just because I say our, that heaven may not be our final destination, I'm not saying that there's not this intermediate period, that there's this intermediate period uh, that we call heaven or paradise or eternal sleep. As we're waiting, as if we die, we go to be with Jesus as we wait for Jesus to return. All right? So I know that, I hope that answers any questions or thoughts you may have had. So, verse 21, he says, He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. And then we move into chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. So, because we are waiting for Jesus to return, we are waiting for Jesus to conform our bodies into resurrected bodies, and because we're waiting for Jesus to finally put all things subject to himself, he says, in that hope then, brothers and sisters, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm. Stand firm against the opponents who will say to you that you can only be a follower of Jesus if you do all these rituals. Stand firm against those opponents that we fall at the beginning of Genesis that were, that had imprisoned Paul, that were giving the Philippians a hard time. Stand firm against those people in the city of Philippi who are offended and threatened by your confession that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. So basically he's saying, because of all this good stuff, stand firm because Jesus has, uh, has, is going to come back and then he's going to subject all things. And he also tells us, uh, I think in some way, to remember the mindset that Jesus wants us to have. And that he wants us to have that kind of mindset where Jesus came from the heavens, he became, took on human flesh, he became a servant, he was died, and then he was basically risen, he was resurrected again. All right, so stand firm. All right, well, let's move on a little bit farther into chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 2. And I'm going to read verses 2 through 7. It says, I urge Ayuda and I urge Suntihe to be of the same mind in the Lord. We could also do the, Hebrew, the English pronunciation, Yudia or, 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 or Suntihe, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companions, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So let's just kind of stop there. So, so basically from verses 2 to 3, Paul shifts his argument. He begins to get a little more personal again. He says, I urge, basically he's asking that two women be of the same mind in the Lord. And he's asking a companion in verse 3, a loyal companion, to help these women because they have struggled with Paul in the work of the gospel. Interesting. All right? Basically, he begins to address that there must be, there's two women, two people, that are not seeing eye to eye. I guess there's some disagreement. We don't know what the issue are. But basically, two women uh, that are basically at odds with each other. Right? And, he, and so, and Paul is very concerned about this. He, he basically has written this letter and he waits till now to basically point out that these two important women start basically re re reconcile whatever the issue is so that they begin uh, to, uh, so that it does affect the rest of the church. All right? So there is some church conflict, I guess. Now, some scholars have wondered if maybe the whole letter of Philippians was written 
because he wanted to address these two women who may have been leaders in the church. Okay? So some scholars have wondered if this whole letter and all the things that Paul was saying about mindset and having the mind that was in Christ is actually addressing in a larger way to women. It's almost as if, say, there are two key leaders in the church. And so Paul decides to write, he's thinking it's the best approach, to send a letter to the whole church. And he's talking about what is expected and how much he cares about the church and the kind of mindset that we should have and all those good things and how he's encouraged them to stand up against their opponents as they're waiting for Jesus to return. And then he shifts and, be, and does all this as a way to get the whole church to think about these two women who may have some issues. Now, in verse 2, okay, he says to be of the same mind. Now, we've seen that, that, that phrase, same mind, before. Okay? Same mind. We've seen it a few verses before here. To be of the same mind. And so, uh, and, and so basically, uh, Paul is now going back into the letter where he's talked about having the same attitude, the same mind, and he calls upon these two women to have the same mind. If you remember in chapter 2, as I earlier talked about, he said this, chapter 2. In verse 4, it says, Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So Paul is using this phrase, same mind. And he says, Who though in the form of God did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied him help, taken the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has also exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus and every knee should bend in heaven on earth and under earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, what I'm sensing is that Paul is saying, Women, leaders, have that same mind as Jesus had. Have that same kind of mindset that whatever's going on, that you're letting it go. You're not trying to hold on to it, grasp it. Let it go so that Jesus can be exalted. Because we all know this. We all know this. If we've been in any church or organization for whatever period of time, that if leaders are at odds with each other, if leaders are fighting with each other, it affects the whole organization. It can suck energy out of the organization. In a church, if a pastor is having a disagreement with another member, it can cause all sorts of problems. And if two key leaders or two key people in the church, these people had to be important enough that Paul uh, basically singled them out. And so Paul is saying, I urge you, I urge you, both of you, Yudia and Cynthia, uh, uh, Sincheya, I always pronounce Suntihe, excuse me, we'll do it through uh, Greek pronunciation, Suntihe, to be of the same mind. And so then he, then he says, and then in verse 3, yes, I also, also ask you, my loyal companion, to help these women. So he's calling upon some companions in the church to help these two women be of the same mind. Right? And he says, do it by having the attitude and mindset that Jesus had. And he says, for, for these people have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement, some other well-known leader in the church, and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay? So all these people, including these women, have struggled they, into the work of the gospel. And he uses this term, the book of life. Now, you may have heard that phrase before, uh, but it's a fun little phrase. He, it's interesting Paul will bring this up. You'll see this place in one place in Psalms, chapter 
uh, 69, verse 28 says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be a road among the righteous. Paul, God is addressing basically the unrighteous and he says they're going to be blotted out of the book of the living, that they're going to die. Okay? Um, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, it says this, Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your names out of the book of life. So this was a Jewish idea of a book of life that you were actually written in. And basically, you were going to have eternal life. And if you were not in that book, you would basically be dead. You would see, basically be dead. You would not be living. And so Paul is saying, he's encouraging these two women, companions to help these women get along, and other co-workers for everybody to get along, to remember that the most important thing is not so much just the, the secondary issues, but that our names are written in the book of life. We're going to be living forever, okay? And because of that, let's get along now. Let's work it out now. Let's, uh, let's uh, uh, get this, let's work out our issues together, all right? Before I go on, let me see if there's any questions or comments on the field. Good, good, good. All right. So we're in chapter 4, and so Paul basically has focused on a church conflict issue, okay? He's just saying, okay, everybody start getting along, let's work this out, especially these two women. And then in verse 4 he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Say that again, verse 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everybody. And so, Paul is talking to the church, and he uses two words. Rejoice. Rejoice gentleness and he puts them side by side remember we're talking to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi they're surrounded by a bunch of Roman retired soldiers and all sorts of people there these Christians believe that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar they're dealing with opponents who basically, some of them, I guess, more of those uh, what we we'll call Judaizers, those who are saying, you, in order to be a real believer in Jesus, you got to do certain Mosaic laws. They're dealing with the fact that they're missing Paul. He's in prison. And they're realizing they could be too. So all that context, and Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And he uses the word always rejoice and that word rejoice is in some way a, 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 is a, it, it's more of a public display in some sense yes we can do it it's important that we do it individually but it, it has a sense of a, 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 a public expression rejoice in the Lord always again I say rejoice so he's saying he's kind of double edged it's kind of like a a parent or a leader saying you need to do this and then they come back and say again you need to do this so he says rejoice you know that that idea of rejoicing is something like wish something well you know focus on that something well focus on that okay but he says but when he does that but, but when he says that he 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 pairs it up with gentleness he pairs it up with Gentleness. So in other words, rejoice the Lord again always. I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Let this be what's known to everyone. Both the people in the church that you may have differences with, or you may go to get along well, and those outside the church. Be gentle. 
and rejoice. So in other words, our public rejoicing should be done in a spirit of gentleness. That when we rejoice, we're not in people's faces. We're not forcing upon people. We're not requiring it. We're not expecting them to rejoice with us because we do it with a spirit of gentleness. Let that gentleness be known. Let that be known more than anything else. Don't let crudeness or rudeness be known. Don't let the anger be known. Let the gentleness be known. What an interesting pair here. Rejoice and be gentle. And so, uh, uh, and so in this way is command. These are kind of commands from Paul. Uh, John Wesley says this about these verses. If men are not gentle towards you, yet neither on this nor on any other account, be careful but pray. Anxiety and prayer cannot stand together. So basically, we're going to see in a second that we talk about rejoice and gentleness because this is going to be connected to something next. So Paul calls upon this church to rejoice and be gentle. And then he says, the Lord is near. So rejoice, have a spirit of gentleness, and remember the Lord is near. Now we've seen that phrase, Lord is near, before. Lots of scholars think it's because there's this expectation, this, this anticipation that Jesus is going to return. So because there's that kind of anticipation, it empowers us to be rejoiced in the difficult times in a spirit of gentleness. Now, some have wondered if maybe this Lord is near. It's not so much talking about Jesus' return, but kind of saying it like in the same way, the Lord is near to us right now. That his presence is with us. So that we can rejoice in difficult times always in a spirit of gentleness because the presence of the Lord is with us. And I guess you could say it that way. So probably many would probably say it's, it's the expectation of that Jesus is near, that his return is near. But I'm going to ask you a question as we're thinking about uh, if we hold to the interpretation that the Lord is near is about Jesus' return, how is it, how do we both cultivate an expectation, an expectation that Jesus could return at any time. But also a realization that has already been 2,000 years and Jesus hasn't returned, which means that Jesus may not return for thousands of more years. How do we, how do we live in that kind of life of both expecting and ready for Jesus to return at any time, but living life as if we're in here for the long term? Because there's two dangers here. We could be, oh, Jesus is going to return, and we're not, and then that leads us to think, I don't care what happens on this earth because, hey, Jesus is coming back. It's all going to blow up anyway. Well, that's one extreme. But the other is that you're so focused on the hearing now that the, you lose that kind of that anticipation that Jesus could return any time. You know, how do we cultivate a life that holds both to the urgent reality of Jesus' return while also accepting the reality we could be here for the long term? You know, I think that we should just have the mindset of Jesus then. Let's have the mindset of waiting for Christ, but waiting for Jesus in the way he did. He gave up. His, his grasping of, of what he had as his divinity and he submitted himself as a servant and have that sense that, that we live out our lives on this earth with the knowledge oh, Jesus could return at any moment yes because our mindset is focused on Jesus but also we understand it could be the long term because our mindset is also focused on Jesus and his approach to life and so basically we could find maybe that kind of tension relief that way, but it's something to think about. How do we both live in the reality that Jesus could return any time, but also the realization it's already been 2,000 years, it could be 7,000, several thousand more years before he returns, which says to us, 
most of us will not be here if that is true. And so that's something to chew on. Or it could be that we're basically, the Lord is near in the sense that Paul is just talking about how Jesus is present with us. Anyway, both are important. But then Paul comes and, uh, and I'm going to kind of, kind of end here. In that passage, after Paul says all this, verse 6, do not worry about anything, but in everything. So verse 6 again, let me, let me say, do not worry about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All right? Probably most likely the church of Philippal had a lot to be worried about, like we do. Lots of things to be anxious about. The things that any human has to deal with day to day. Health, concerns, jobs, but also maybe the reality of how people are going to respond to our faith. But he says, Paul says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about anything. You notice he says that? Don't worry about anything. Anything. So in other words, we may say, well, this one or two things, that's a big thing. I should be able to worry about that. Paul, don't worry about anything. And he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So how do we deal with worry? Paul says, by prayer, by prayer, and a kind of prayer that is supplication with thanksgiving. And supplication, it, it has that idea of kind of aggressive kind of prayer, a kind of, it's almost close to this idea that you're begging a little bit. And you know, like a child who sometimes begs for something they can't get, a little bit like that. But it's it's even deeper than that. It's 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 aggressive. It's active. Uh, it uh, it is uh, attentional. So Paul says, when worry comes, do not worry, but with prayer. And what kind of prayer will look like? It's kind of a, an aggressive, attentional prayer that also has thanksgiving with it. So in other words, be thankful for what you have. What you, God has already brought you through. While you're expressing to you, you're just laying your heart out before God. You're laying it all out there for God. You're saying, God, I am worried, I'm concerned, and you lay that all out there. Okay? So you got the worry. So you have all this worry going on about everything happening. Paul says, pray with a kind of intentionality and thanksgiving. Pray in thanksgiving. And he says, what can that lead to? A kind of peace. And he says the language of a peace that passes understanding. A peace that doesn't make sense. A peace that is unusual and uh, uh, different. Because the human tendency to worry, and worry does not create peace, it creates stress and ulcers and all sorts of problems. Paul says, don't worry. But he tells us how not to do it. Do a kind of a suppl supplication kind of thanksgiving prayer. And keep doing it, and then it'll create a peace. A kind of deep peace. Not just emotionally, but always. It's like in all different ways. And so that it, it, it can create peace, a kind of, uh, in the situations that we may find ourselves in. And it's beyond understanding because it doesn't make sense. You know, we should be worrying about this, but we don't worry about it because we have peace about it. But that peace makes no sense because things are still kind of not looking good. That passes understanding. And so 
That is what Pete wants. And he's writing to the church at Philippi to say, you guys can have that. And so then he ends with verse 6. And so, and the peace of God will surpass us all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this peace. So if you're going to have a guard at your heart, okay? So you have a mind. You have your mind and your heart. Basically, Paul is dealing with the totality, both in your mind and your emotions. He says there should be a guard there. That guard should be peace and not worry. If you're going to have a guard at your mind and heart, let it be peace and not worry. Let that guard you, protect you, keep you safe from anything and everything. Keep you safe and protected from everything that worry will bring about. Even if the circumstances around you are falling apart. You know, you sometimes will hear people say, when loved ones have died and they're in a lot of grief, they kind of sometimes feel a peace that goes beyond an understanding. I've been in situations in my own life where I've been terminated, I've been terminated from a church, been forced out, or uh, a job closed up, or something like that. And I was praying about it, but I wasn't worried about it. It was like there was this peace. And I'm like, why is this peace coming from? Because, man, I don't have a job now. Paul is telling us who guards our hearts is very important. And so how do we get the peace guard? We got to pray about it. We got to get into it. We got to be intentional. And we have to be thanks thankful about it. And so prayer does so many things, but it can cultivate in our lives, especially when we're thanking God for things, it can create a kind of peace that can guard our, our, our body, souls, and spirits. All right. Well, we're going to end there for this evening, and uh, we're going to come to an ending there. And then we'll begin uh, later on. I want to let you know that... Uh, we're getting close to the end of Philippians. A couple of things, and I'm trying to think about what we're going to do next. And I'm, I'm thinking about maybe looking at a few psalms. Psalms. Uh, I've not really done a, a real study, per se. I've done a over that, uh, uh, on psalms. And so I'm thinking about maybe looking at some of the psalms uh, for some studies. And if there's any psalms that you would like for me to look at, I know we have some of our favorites. And... I may look at those or may not. I mean, Psalms 23 is one of those that's used a lot. I might look at some of those psalms that we don't always use but are really important. But if there are some, some psalms that you've seen in your life that you would like for us to look at, why don't you let me know? Send me a message. Uh, and then probably and once we finish this study in Philippians, I think we're going to spend a little time in the psalms and, and looking at those and studying those. Uh, the song book, basically, of God's people. All right, well, tomorrow night, I'm going to let you know for our community prayer time. Uh, I've been asked by Scott Hareton to basically go up to Louisville. And Scott's, have, Scott's been biking, basically, raising awareness uh, for prostate cancer. He's, he's, done, he's just done a phenomenal job. And there's going to be a big kind of get-together and a, uh, up in the walking bridge up in Louisville. So my goal is this. I'm hoping to basically do our normal community prayer time at 630. There's always a possibility something could happen, but my goal is to be up in Louisville, and I'm going to do my community prayer time around 6.30 because I'm going to be praying at this event uh, somewhere around 7.40. So I uh, just want to let you know uh, what I'm going to be up to tomorrow night. All right, everybody. I hope you uh, are having, you'll have a good evening. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. As always, I want to hear from you. And... Uh, Next Wednesday, we'll continue on with our Bible study from Philippines. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.